oh, maybe people actually like me for more than my juicy ass. I have started splitting my monthly book wrap ups into two parts because I have just been reading way too many books. But when I said that, a lot of people commented saying that I was also doing it so that I could get more sponsorships. First of all, I cannot believe that you would accuse me of being so greedy and capitalistic like that. Second of all, you are absolutely right because this video has been sponsored by Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast growing online book service for readers. Their team vets hundreds of books each month and gives readers their choice from a curated selection of new and early release titles. You can skip any month, any time, and you will not be charged. The books that they picked for the month of October include Magic Lessons, which is a historical paranormal fantasy about witches, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which is another paranormal fantasy written by a very popular author, V.E. Schwab, High Set Tether, which is a contemporary romance featuring a Nigerian woman, Leave the World Behind, which is a mystery thriller written by a black author, and The Girl in the Mirror, which is a debut thriller novel about identical twin sisters. I am gonna push the deadline for this giveaway to next month in November because the books that they picked this month are so freaking good that I plan on reading all of them. But if you want the books guaranteed, and if you want them right now, you can actually get your first box for $9.99 using my code READWITHCINDY, which is a really good deal, by the way, because these are new hardcover books by very popular authors. You're not going to find that price anywhere else in a bookstore. Now let's talk about all the books that I read in the month of September. The first book that I read is The Disaster Tourist. This is a dystopian novel about a woman who works at a travel company called Jungle. They specialize in vacation packages to destinations that have been specifically hit by disaster or climate change. Why do people want to visit those areas? I don't know because humans are awful. Apparently disaster tourism is a thing. I didn't even know about that until I read this book. Unfortunately, I'm not really surprised. The plot begins when the main character gets into trouble at work because she gets sexually harassed by one of her co-workers and she decides to report it. And you know how it be when a woman reports assault. The assaulter doesn't actually get consequences, but the woman does. So that's what happens with her. The travel company offers a proposition to her, which is to give her a paid vacation to a deserted island on the terms that she has to pose as a tourist so that she can get some notes and intel on whether they should keep that remote island. That island has been an unprofitable destination for a while so the company is evaluating whether it's worth continuing their partnership and so they're just sending her over as like a guinea pig. She travels to this island, she finds out that the only thing that's there is this giant sinkhole so everyone that paid premium to go here is like yo what the fuck is this? I thought we were gonna get some really gritty disaster shit and instead we just get a sinkhole? How can I be a piece of shit properly if you're not gonna give me anything more disastrous than this? But the main character finds out that there is much more of because she discovers the resort's plan to actually fabricate catastrophe in order to get more tourism, which means that they are going to manufacture their own disasters at the cost of their own citizens' lives. Oh my god, who could have guessed? that people valued property over actual lives. What a surprise indeed, except not really, because again, humankind is very shitty. That's basically the synopsis of the plot. I picked up this book because I thought it had a really interesting concept that explores the consequences of our fascination with disasters. Obviously, the story criticizes the tourism industry and the human damage to our environment. It also questions how much of a role that an individual has if they are a part of an industry that is doing active harm to Towards those people. There's a lot of themes around climate activism and dark tourism that I thought was super interesting, but I ended up rating this book three stars because even though I did like the idea, I didn't feel like the themes were explored as deeply as I would like. What I told you from the synopsis is pretty much what you get. So I kind of wish there would have been more twists and turns or surprises or more nuance or gray morality to the conversation, but you pretty much get what you can expect just from hearing the synopsis like that. It's a very short story too so that's probably why it's so straightforward. I would have been curious to see what it would be like if it were an extended novel with actual twists and turns. You might like it if you're looking for more Asian books to read or if you're looking for a very short book to read or if you're so sick of being stuck home during quarantine and you want to read a book that makes you think oh maybe it's good that I'm not traveling after all and contributing to a very very harmful industry. I have a lot more to talk about in the next book that I read which is Know My Name. This is a memoir 
memoir written by Chanel Miller, who is the survivor of the sexual assault case that happened in Stanford. She was the woman anonymously known as Emily Doe, who was raped behind a dumpster at a frat party by a guy named Brock Turner. The only reason why she found out she got raped and why anyone found out that she got raped was because while he was doing that to her while she was unconscious, there were two Swedish men who were transfer students at Stanford bicycling through and they saw what was happening and they chased after him and had to literally stop him and pin him to the ground. They literally yelled at him and said, what the fuck are you doing? Because she looked like a dead body because of how unconscious that she was. I'm sure you have heard of this story before because she wrote a victim impact statement and it got published on Buzzfeed and it went viral everywhere. If not, you probably have seen his mugshot before. I'll put it right there. He's an ugly motherfucker right here. Look at this piece of shit right here. That mugshot was everywhere and it became so public because of how trivial his sentencing was. He did something so horrible to this girl. But when it happened, the news published him as a successful Stanford swimmer instead of describing him as an actual rapist. And the judge ended up sentencing him to six months in county jail, which actually turned out to be three months because of good behavior. In the memoir, she pretty much takes you from the beginning when she got invited by her sister to go to this party. She talks about the next day waking up at the hospital and finding all these leaves and pine cones in her hair and all these bruises on her body and not knowing what had actually happened and the fear of not knowing what really happened. Then the double fear from finding out what actually happened and the very, very long arduous process of dealing with a trial in court where you basically have to relive it over and over again as lawyers aggressively try to question you and make you seem like you had deserved it. It's not a fucking good time at all. But I am so glad that I read it because I believe this is the best memoir that I've read so far. This might be like the top book that I've read all year. There's a lot of it that's very personal to me as well. She's an Asian girl from the Bay Area. I'm an Asian girl from the Bay Area. Our hometowns are actually an hour apart from each other. She went to UC Santa Barbara for college. I went to UC Davis, which is actually the sister school of UC Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara was actually my second second choice, so I would have attended there if I hadn't gone to Davis. She works as a full-time artist now. I also work as an art director. Our ages are pretty close to each other. There's just a lot that I was able to see myself in her. It could have been me. It could have been any of my friends that I grew up with. I saw so much of myself in her. I saw so many people that I grew up with. When you see someone who is very similar to you, you want to know how they're able to cope through all the crazy shit that can happen and so that you can kind of like, you know, take notes like, oh, she coped it this way? Okay, I'm gonna try to do the same thing to try to cope with my bullshit. Beyond just talking about her rape case, she also dives into the general conversation of how women are treated and our culture that perpetuates the way that proportionally speaking, men take advantage of women, both physically, emotionally, and mentally. I found so much of this to be relatable as well. For example, she moved to a different city where over there she got catcalled pretty much every day whenever she walked home. That was the exact same experience that I had when I moved to a different city and I was catcalled every single day walking. She was also at UC Santa Barbara when there was a school shooting. There was a guy who was very angry that no girl would date him and he ended up killing, I think around six or seven women. Chanel Miller was at that school while that happened, while she was in the process of going through her trial. And by the way, what the fuck? She literally experienced two terrible, extremely traumatic things in one single lifetime. And I think there should just be at least one trauma that we are allowed and we just like cap it off. Like just have a maximum of one trauma per lifetime. No more than this, okay? But yeah, she was there and obviously the circumstances for how that shooting happened related to our bigger conversation about consent. I have a friend who went to UC Santa Barbara and he was also there when the shooting happened and he was also still very traumatized by that incident. So there's just a lot of uncomfortable things to relate to. I really, really saw so much of myself in her and so much of my life in her. I personally was really interested in reading those courtroom scenes and reading those legal procedures because I have never been in a courtroom before, but just reading all of it made me so fucking exhausted seeing how she tried to balance a normal life while trying to resolve this issue that's just hanging over her body for the rest of her life. And having all these scumbag lawyers try to dehumanize her, it really shuts light onto why so many victims don't report this because once you see what the process is actually like, it's fucking terrifying and you don't even know if it'll be successful. So beyond the rape incident, it's 
also such a huge eye opener to our justice system and the way that we process things in court. The writing was so damn good. If you read her victim impact statement, you know that she's a good writer, but this memoir was like her taking steroids or some shit because that was just some next level shit. She didn't get a ghost writer. She didn't partner with anyone to write the book. She wrote it all herself and you can really tell that she wrote her ass off because holy shit, there were just so many good ideas and revelations that were connected together. There's so many good quotes that I can pull from this book, but if I do, this video will never end. So I'm just gonna read only a few. There's a really good quote that came up when the trial was an ongoing process and a lot of people were lamenting over Brock Turner's future and how he has so much potential and how his future is gonna be ruined because of this mistake that he made. It was very sympathetic towards him and what he would lose as a rapist who is dealing with the consequences. And she wrote a really good quote where she said, most of us understand that your future future is not promised to you. It is constructed day by day through the choices you make. Your future is earned little by little through hard work and action. If you don't act accordingly, that dream dissolves. If punishment is based on potential, privileged people will be given lighter sentences. Perhaps she snapped. Perhaps she snapped. There's another quote that I really, really liked. It was after the case was over, Stanford wanted to have some kind of way to commemorate her by building a garden in the spot where she had been raped behind that dumpster. So they were like, oh, let's build a nice little garden so that we can associate it with happy memories and moving forward instead of this awful thing that happened that's very bad for the image of our school. They wanted to have this plaque that would have a quote. They let her choose the quote, except whenever she chose chose a quote, they said no, because a lot of it was controversial or made it seem negative towards the dude. She submitted three different quotes. They said no all three times. Instead, they suggested for her to put in the quote when she told her sister, I'm okay, I'm gonna be okay, everything's gonna be okay. Out of context, that does seem like a hopeful quote, but within the context, she had said that to her sister at the hospital after she woke up and she knew that things weren't okay and she had to lie to her sister so that her sister wouldn't feel bad. It was really just a big PR move that Stanford was trying to do. They still have that garden at Stanford and she wrote this really good quote where she says, I encourage you to sit in that garden, but when you do, close your eyes and I'll tell you about the real garden the sacred place. 90 feet away from where you sit there is a spot where Brock's knees hit the dirt, where the Swedes tackled him to the ground, yelling, what the fuck are you doing? Do you think this is okay? Put their words on a plaque. Mark that spot, because in my mind, I've erected a monument. The place to be remembered is not where I was assaulted, but where he fell, where I was saved, where two men declared, stop, no more, not here, not now, not ever. Perhaps she fucking snapped. Perhaps she snapped. There were so many goddamn good lines that she wrote where I was like, holy shit. She wrote her fucking ass off on this book. I am so impressed by the way that she's managed to articulate everything. Such difficult topics, but she's written it so beautifully. It's so damn good. Five stars all around. The next book that I read is The Falling in Love Montage, which is a YA contemporary romance. The main character is a teenage girl who doesn't believe in true love or happy endings. She is very emotionally closed off and is afraid of commitment because her mother deals with onset early dementia. Her struggle with dealing with losing her mom in that aspect, as well as knowing that she might have early onset dementia in the future is what influences her to not be that close to other people because who knows if your memories will be wiped out later on. She avoids relationships. She's only here for flings and that's about it. The plot begins when she meets this other girl. The other girl is very mischievous and she is a huge fan of rom-coms, of course. She proposes this idea where this summer, Let's have a really fun rom-com style relationship. It'll just be one summer of fun with every cliche, every rom-com trope, they'll fit it all in. And then by the end of the summer, they'll just call it quits and there will be no hard feelings, right? 
right? Surely nothing bad ever happens whenever two characters decide to just keep it casual like that, right? This is basically a coming of age sapphic young adult story that discusses a lot about mostly straight rom-coms and the tropes that they have and how a lot of gay stories don't typically have that same kind of treatment that straight couples have in romantic comedies, nor do they have happy endings usually. So I think it is cute to see these two girls have their own rom-com montage no matter how cheesy or cliche it is because everyone deserves that no matter what sexuality you are. And I hope that girls who read this book will be able to envision that in their own life too. Is it on the nose sometimes? Yes. I don't know what it is, but it feels like so many fictional characters really like to talk about tropes or completing a checklist or a bucket list with someone that you just met and yet people in real life never do. Most of the time, people don't make meta commentary about how they're gonna follow this trope in their life. But they were doing it constantly to the point where it was like getting too meta and it was like, all right, I get what you're talking about. But still, it was cute. I also liked how the book covered that subject of struggling with a family member who deals with dementia. It showed not just the effects of her mom having that, but also the impacts of the main character dealing with that and her father dealing with that. I rated the book three stars because even though I do appreciate those topics being covered. I couldn't find myself being personally invested or emotionally attached to this story. I didn't feel much chemistry between the main characters, especially when so much of the conflict and the angst regarding the relationship and regarding what the protagonist is dealing with is very much self-inflicted. That's one of my pet peeves whenever I read a book to see miscommunication for the sake of conflict. And that was like the driving force for the entire book. It is frustrating to see that she could could easily be in a happy, healthy relationship if she just, I don't know, communicated and not lied all the time because she would lie to her love interest and then she would snap at her for lying and then she would lie about lying. Like she literally told her, okay, no more lies. And then the narration said, that was another lie. And I'm like, why bitch? Why are you just making things unnecessarily complicated for yourself? It's this constant pattern of lying and then getting mad about lying. I'm like, bitch, get a grip. And I know that is the point of her character where she can be self-destructive and try to catastrophize everything in her life. But that doesn't mean that I wanna put up with it. Like, it's still frustrating for me to read that. I personally prefer conflicts where the characters could not help it. That's more interesting for me to read because then it's like, oh shit, how are they gonna get out of here? How are they gonna get out out of this mess. But if I read a conflict that's self-inflicted, then I'm just like, girl, just get your shit together and then you wouldn't be here in the first place. Anyway, it's probably ironic that I'm saying that because I'm definitely dealing with my own internal struggles and if my therapist was watching this, she would call me a hypocrite. But still, doesn't mean I wanna read that shit. Overall, cute concepts, not so much of a cute execution for me, but if you're looking for, you know, a sapphic YA, then you can check the book out. Maybe you will like it more than I did. The next book that I read was a book that was featured in Book of the Month last month, and that is Transcendent Kingdom. This follows the main character who is studying neuroscience at Stanford University. And she is always in a lab experimenting with mice so that she can find out more about the neural circuits of depression and addiction. And she was largely interested in this because her mother is dealing with depression and her brother passed away from addiction to opioids. So she becomes super dedicated to her work so that she can find some kind of logic and scientific basis to why there's so much suffering around her. But at the same time, the book also deals with her grappling with her own faith. Since her family are immigrants from Ghana, she grew up in a very religious upbringing. The book kind of tackles this balance between science versus faith. And they are both different ways of how she's able to cope and analyze and deal with the suffering that she's had throughout her life. I do think it's interesting to see that balance between religion versus science because I think a lot of times we view it as one or the other whereas the main character is grappling with this idea of having both. This deals with a lot of grief and loss and addiction. It can be very depressing to read. I coincidentally read this after I watched A Star Is Born, which I found out later watching the movie that it also deals with addiction. So I was just having clearly a good time all around reading this depressing shit. I rated this book three stars because it didn't quite hit me hard personally, but I do think that there's still a lot of emotional depth in the writing. And I still felt really, really sympathetic for the protagonist and her family. I was much more engaged towards the latter half of the book because you got to see more of her 
family and more of the climax of what had happened throughout her life that she finally confronts with. But overall, I couldn't get into it. I think it might be due to the writing style. The book isn't really like a series of events. It's more like reading a diary of someone's thought process and going through that internal journey of her figuring out her faith and how much she really believes in it, which I think has its merits to it. But because I am not a person who is very religious or faithful, I think that's why it didn't really resonate with me as much. But I do think that readers who have a closer tie to spirituality might feel much harder for this book. The next book that I read is Such a Fun Age. This is a contemporary book about a white young lady and her black babysitter and all the fun, awkward shenanigans that happen between the two. The plot begins when there is an emergency because someone threw a brick in the window of the white lady's house, so she has to call the police, but she doesn't want her child to be there when the police come over. So she does an emergency call to that babysitter to just take the kid to the supermarket and just distract the kids for a few hours before the house is ready again. However, the neighborhood that they're in is a pretty bougie place. So the supermarket they're going to is probably like Whole Foods or some shit, which means that when the babysitter takes a toddler there, the security guard ends up accusing her of kidnapping. There's like this whole incident that happens because she's like, no, I'm really just trying to take care of the kid. And the security guard is like, nah, no, you aren't. Something about a black woman with a white kid just doesn't sit right with me. There's no way that there could be anything not suspicious about this. She ends up having to call the dad so that he can come over and explain that she really is just a babysitter. There is also a guy that was there who takes a video of the situation. He's taking the video and he's like, you can't do this. This is discrimination. I'm gonna share this video to the whole internet. And the main girl is just like, uh, how about you don't do that? Because I'm trying not to be the next viral video of another black person getting accused by a cop. So he's like, all right, but I'm still your ally no matter what. That's really the starting point from there. It's a very simplistic story from there. You see how these three central characters, the young rich white lady, the babysitter, and the other white ally get interwoven together. This is essentially a story about performative activism and woke culture. I ended up writing this four stars because I thought it was a very accurate depiction of that. I recognize so many people that I know in real life <coughs> and kind of on booktube <coughs> within those central characters. The book portrays what being a liberal white ally looks like and the way that we delude ourselves into thinking that we're woke or that we're doing something positive, but it's really just a self-serving narrative. In particular, the guy that was at the grocery store, his name is Kelly. And from the moment he was introduced, I knew exactly the type of person that he was. He was just super into the incident that happened at the grocery store to the point where he was very overzealous about it, very persistent about trying to spread this video and try to take the police down. He gave so many white savior vibes and it just kept on increasing for the rest of the book. He reminded me so much of white men that I have met a lot in Virginia specifically who pride themselves on being woke and being liberal. Same thing for Alex who is the young rich white lady. She is very much a well-meaning white person, but she gets so caught up in not trying to look racist that she overcompensates for it. The most fun part about this book for me is actually seeing Alex and Kelly knock heads against each other because I just think it's so funny that they're having this battle on who is the more racist one because they're like, no, you're racist. No, you're racist. I care about the babysitter. Kelly's telling Alex, you're just using her. And Alex is telling Kelly, you have a black girl fetish and that's dehumanizing and it's such a fucking mess but I love it. I love seeing white on white crime. Essentially their whole dynamic is really showing how so many people use performative activism as a way to massage their egos and they give themselves this bullshit narrative that they're doing something for the sake of being an activist when really it's just because your butt hurt about something or your ego is bruised and now you're trying to use this social issue as a way to justify your own sensitivities. I rated this book four stars because I did enjoy reading it, but I didn't feel like it blew me away to the point where I would give it five stars. I think because the story is so straightforward, that is what makes it kind of predictable. I still think the portrayals are so accurate and so relevant to a lot of people, but I kind of wish there were more 
more revelations that I could have experienced where I was like, oh wow, I never thought about it that way before. Or like, oh wow, that's a whole new layer I didn't even consider. Unfortunately, I know all too well about this shit, so it wasn't really a surprise to me. But I still really enjoyed it. It's nice sometimes to see a very painfully accurate portrayal of just annoying ass people in real life. Finally, the last book that I'm gonna cover for part one of this wrap up is Take a Hint, Danny Brown, which is a romance book that is a spin-off of Get a Life, Chloe Brown. This follows Chloe Brown's younger sister, Danny. She is a cool bitch with a shaved head and she dyes her hair color all the time and she has a tattoo on her ass. So she's kind of like the wild child, but she's also very, very academically studious and a super, super workaholic. So she's really just this cool bitch that knows exactly what she wants. She has a big dreams and big ambitions to be successful academically in her field of work. And she knows for herself that she doesn't want a romantic relationship. She's into dudes, she's into women, she's into anyone on the spectrum, but she likes them on a friends with benefits level. And she's looking for another fuck buddy. Lo and behold, there is a broody, grumpy security guard who happens to be super hot. He works at the same university that she works in. He's this huge muscular dude. He's an ex rugby player, but even though he looks kind of scary on the outside, he's actually a big softy on the inside and he's super romantic and sensitive and sweet and pretty much basically the type of guy that I like and that's why I picked this book up. And the plot begins when there is this fire alarm situation that happens in their university. He carries her out of the building and somebody records it and it becomes this viral video. So the whole internet is like, oh my God, hashtag Dr. Rugby. The main characters are like, um, this is fucking weird. But he realizes that this situation can be used for something good because he actually has a sports charity on the side of his usual security guard job. It's his charity that really needs more funding. He realizes that with his new internet fame, a lot of people are discovering that charity and paying attention to it and donating to it. He proposes to her that if they continue faking a relationship, then that will really help the charity out. And she's thinking, damn, I really wanna bang him, but at least I can say this was for charity. You mean I can lie to help children? Who can refuse that? So she's like, all right, we're gonna fake a relationship in public, but behind the scenes, I'm gonna try to seduce this man because I really need a fuck buddy and I'm just horny all the time. And honestly, I'm so glad that I have the representation in Danny Brown that I deserve because not only do I relate to her priorities, but I also relate to her taste in men. So good for her. But unfortunately, her dreams of having an easy lay are thwarted by <gasps> real feelings? Who could have predicted this in a romance book? Who could have known that another way to be horny is to be horny in the heart? I only wanna be horny in my coochie, not in my heart. I didn't sign up for this. The author so far has been super consistent in giving us a very cute and romantic and fluffy book to read, topped off with a lot of smutty scenes, and you know I'm all about that. I really enjoy the dynamic of this book because when it comes to straight relationships, I am a fan of the female character being the more cynical, jaded, hardened one, and the male character being the more sensitive and romantic one. Cause that's basically, if I were to be in a straight relationship, that's pretty much what I would be looking for. More than that though, there were a lot of portrayals of mental health struggles and anxiety, particularly with the main male character because he has to deal with the grief of losing his father and his brother. He deals with a lot of anxiety since that incident as well. And I thought those things were handled really, really well. I buddy read this with a friend who also deals with anxiety. She absolutely loves the book because she thought the portrayal of what he was dealing with was extremely accurate, along with how Danny was so supportive of the things that he was struggling with. They were both very kind and patient to each other, which is really, really sweet to see. Danny's whole deal with her being a workaholic makes her think that her being so dedicated to her work is like a barrier to her being in a serious relationship. So it's really nice to see the main guy be so honestly and genuinely supportive of her that she realizes, oh, maybe people actually like me for more than my juicy ass. And you know, it's just sweet to see. The third act conflict is also a little bit better compared to Chloe Brown because last time I complained that the whole Chloe Brown third act conflict came out of nowhere and I was like, what the fuck? I'm getting whiplash from this shit. But this one, it was kind of building up to it. So you kind of saw it coming anyway. Was it necessary? Uh, not really, but it did give me whiplash. So it's a little bit better. You got over.
over with pretty quickly. I rated it four stars. I do think it's interesting though that I had Buddy read this with two people. One of them absolutely loves Chloe Brown, gave it five stars, read this book, gave it two stars, did not like it. The other friend I Buddy read it with did not like Chloe Brown, rated that two stars, ended up loving this book, rated that five stars. So they had the complete total opposite opinions. And the weird thing is both of them are ace and are kind of repulsed by overly sexy scenes. And so my first friend's complaints about the book was that the characters were too focused on how horny they were for each other. Whereas my other friend, who is normally repulsed by scenes like that, just saw so many other merits to this book in their relationship and how they care for each other that she loved it and gave it five stars regardless. So it was interesting to see how two people had such different opinions, even though theoretically they would be repulsed by the same thing. However, since I am a basic horny bitch, I was very consistent with my four star rating. I'm just here to have a good time and a good time I did have. I hope you also had a good time watching part one of my monthly book wrap up. If not, feel free to unsubscribe from my channel. Otherwise, I will see you in part two where I will talk about other books I read for the rest of the month, including another book that I rated five stars. So we will dive into that next week. Bye. In the old school Chevy, uh, I be rolling through my city so heavy, feel like oh my God, that drip so steady, so fresh, so clean, so neat, so pretty.